morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, dear friends. Uh, I'm uh, working on cannabis uh, research already 45 years. I did research 20 years uh, at medical faculty in Olomouc in Czechoslovakia. And now I'm working 25 years on research at School of Pharmacy at Hebrew University in Jerusalem. I think that tomorrow I can have a short talk uh, to show you how it was uh, not easy to legalize medicinal cannabis in Czech Republic because I was involved in that uh, many years and tomorrow I can show you just effort, this was effort of many persons but uh, just my effort uh, how many this were TV shows and uh, radio shows and journals and lectures, so I shall talk a little bit uh, tomorrow about that. <laughs> now I go to my lecture about uh, how we came from cannabis to medicinal cannabis. So cannabis, as you know, it's uh, used worldwide and uh, as you see, very huge amount, uh, amount of persons use uh, cannabis. If you want to say abuse today, they are talking about abuse as cannabis. So I shall use this word, even if in many cases it's not any abuse. About 14 percent thousand use cannabis daily. Usually, you know, these are young persons and it's not good to persecute them because some use just cannabis one time for curiosity and then they have sticker for whole life that they are drug abusers, what is not true. It was just curiosity because I was also young, I was student, we wanted to see how influences alcohol when we were happy after, like, after uh, some uh, exams, yes, and we tried also cigarettes. What, of course, it's not healthy in comparison with cannabis. So also everything was for curiosity. And about 10%, according to the official, are dependent on cannabis. Probably this amount will be lower, approximately 7%. Cannabis is studied already from uh, 1898 from the chemical point of view because scientists wanted to know what are the main compounds, what are the active compounds and up to May this year we know in cannabis uh, where are elucidated structures and identified 1055 compounds 134 from them are compounds which are typical for cannabis plants and you cannot find these compounds in any other plant. Just before I left, I had uh, this amount, uh, eight compounds less, but just now appeared a new, new publication. It's in press, yes, but you can find it already also on internet. That at Mississippi University, they found uh, another eight cannabinoids uh, in high THC plant. This is uh, in the fact in Mississippi University. I did my postdoc over there in 1978-79, so it's a really ancient <laughs> period. And they identified more than half of all these cannabinoids. Scientists wanted to know what is the active compound. And I'm not going to talk uh, about all these uh, discoveries from 1898, but uh, one of the most important uh, at the end of this effort was uh, Roger Adams from the United States. And he, between years 1942 1948, uh, studied uh, many compounds and found structures of cannabidiol and tetrahydrocannabinol. The structure was correct, but there was incorrect uh, double bond. Or better to tell you, he didn't know where is uh, exactly double bond, so structure was not elucidated. 
And in 1963, uh, Professor Shantavi from Palaski University in Olomouc, Czechoslovakia, this is medical faculty where I uh, studied cannabis for 20 years. So he elucidated structure of Delta 98C and even published the absolute configuration of THC, so it means exact structure. It appeared uh, out of press uh, in 1964, and he presented exactly this structure, which uh, today is known that it is correct structure. Also in 1964, Professor Yechiel Gaoni and Rafael Meshula at Weizmann Institute uh, in Rehovo, they isolated uh, tetrahydrocannabinol, uh, as you know it under THC, and elucidated structure. So two independent scientific places at the same time elucidated structure of the same compound. It happened in science uh, uh, many times on different fields that uh, discoveries uh, about at the same time independently. In cannabis are uh, many cannabinoid compounds, but the main and the most important compounds are, which were first identified, this is cannabidiol, tetrahydrocannabinol, and cannabinol. And on the right side, uh, you see that it's a uh, side chain. Uh, is side chain is five carbons, but there are also side chains with uh, three carbons, like cannabidivarol, tetrahydrocannabivarin, and cannabivarin, what are compounds which are also uh, active and useful in medicine. And in the middle is delta 8 THC, delta 8 tetrahydrocannabinol. This is compound which is also psychoactive. This is very stable compound. Uh, we found it in our lab. Uh, and maybe I, I don't know if I have this slide here. In one tomb, old tomb uh, near Jerusalem. And there in material which was uh, in this tomb uh, was delta 8 THC, so it's a very stable compound, about 10 times less active than delta 9 THC. And these are some another compounds uh, from uh, cannabis, cannabigerol, cannabigerol monomethylator, cannabichromen, cannabicyclol, and cannabialzoin. All these compounds, usually you can find when you analyze cannabis so these are on chromatogram visible peaks. Uh, so these are the most common compounds. But to tell you the truth, in the fact all these compounds which I show you, show you in the fact are not in cannabis, in fresh cannabis, because in fresh cannabis, all cannabinoids are in the form of their precursors, it means cannabinoidic acids. And uh, this during the time decarboxylate also in the plant and mostly after uh, harvest and storage but it can take long time and if you want to use it especially in cancer treatment so it's necessary to have decarboxylated compounds so the first uh, cannabinoidic acid is cannabigeronic acid and from this cannabigeronic acid originates in the plant tetrahydrocannabinolic acid and cannabidiolic acid. These compounds are also active, but not uh, from this point of view what we are interested in uh, concerning treatment, how you know it today. The left compound, cannabidiolic acid, this is antibacterially active compound. It's a very important compound. But if we want uh, use it for treatment, so you, we must decarboxylate. I'm not going to tell you more details because uh, Dr. Hornby will talk about decarboxylation more detail tomorrow. So it's important to decarboxylate. It means you heat it and you lose uh, CO2 and then you have uh, tetrahydrocannabinol which is active and very useful for treatment. Concert, uh, cannabis is used uh, already thousands of years 
Master I had in Briblania lecture where, where I had a little history, so I didn't want to repeat it again, so only briefly. So I uh, was physician in Britain. He was physician of Queen also, General Sir Reynolds. And he already published in 1859 publication where he said, for the relief of certain kind of pain, I believe there is no more useful medicine than cannabis within our reach. And 31 years later, he all, also in Lancet Journal published Indiana Hemp when pure and administered carefully is one of the most valuable medicines we possess. So you see that already before more than 100 years, about, about 125 years, uh, already it was in modern medicine evaluated. But uh, real modern uh, cannabis use in medicine starts uh, in Czechoslovakia, at medical faculty where I was born. So I have uh, just only one picture on the right side, with moustache, it's me, when I was working already one year on cannabis research. And these two sitting gentlemen, so on the left is Professor Kabelik, and on the right, with glasses, is Professor Krejci. He studied uh, in 1950 antibacterial principle of the high plants, and found that uh, cannabis is active antibacterially active against uh, gram-positive microorganisms and also against some uh, pathogenic organisms. And it was uh, checked experimentally also at uh, clinic observations. So stomatology, otolarino, long, otolarino oncology, uh, gynecology, dermatology, and so on. And uh, this uh, professor Shantavi, which uh, discovered the structure of THC, they isolated the compound responsible for this antibacterial effect, and they named it cannabidiolic acid, and this was in the fact first cannabinoidic acid which was isolated uh, from cannabis plant. So, in the fact, I was very lucky in my life that I could uh, work with these pioneers in Czechoslovakia, that I work at Mississippi University, where I mostly where I identified cannabinoids, and that I work today with uh, Professor Meshulam, he is called like father of cannabis, you know, a very famous person, and very polite person, and uh, very clever person. So, Already in December 1954, at medical faculty, Palatsky University in Olomouc in Czechoslovakia, was conference, Konoki Jakolek, Cannabis as Medicine. So this was in the fact a real start of uh, medical use of cannabis. And all 20 years when I was working at uh, medical faculty, I prepared uh, cannabis extracts for drugstore, and it was used in medical hospital in Olomouc for treatment. Because at that time, it was not on such level like today. Even when I uh, consider it today that it's like in childhood, because we still don't know enough concerning treatment with cannabis. So at that time it was like antibacterial compounds, so it was used against uh, virus herpes serum simplex. It treated, decided uh, anybody from the faculty came, give me just a tincture of cannabis, I have herpes. And virus herpes was there, and especially for bad sores, it worked very good because patients be, which uh, are for a long period in the bed, so sometimes they can have this bed source up to the bone, it can be open, so cannabis treated it uh, very good. As soon as scientists had uh, structure of psychoactive compound, they wanted to know how it works 
in the organism. And they start hunting for cannabinoid receptor because they expected that these compounds from cannabis bind to cannabinoid uh, bind to some receptors or to some active places. And in 1988, uh, Dr. William Devey at St. Louis, Louis University discovered uh, in red brain cannabinoid receptors. He called them at that time central cannabinoid receptor because it was in the brain. And uh, later was discovered also peripheral cannabinoid receptor. Today, everything is concentrated for compounds which uh, bind to peripheral cannabinoid receptor because it doesn't influence our brain. So this is the target, especially because uh, you must understand that mostly it's uh, illegal substance and it's uh, in mostly in most countries it's prohibited. So the only solution meantime is find just uh, active compounds for CB2 receptor because this can be without any problem. Of course we know that uh, CB1 or central cannabinoid receptor is very important because binds over the tetrahydrocannabinol, what is very powerful medicine. So as soon as uh, Dr. Devane discovered cannabinoid receptors, so again, scientists are very curious to know what is the real compound in the brain which binds to these receptors because it was clear the receptors not in the uh, human body just to wait when somebody starts to smoke uh, cannabis. So many scientific places were working on that and I was lucky that at that time just finished socialism in Czechoslovakia in November 89 and as I was in contact with Professor Meshulam already 16 years even that the uh, police didn't recommend it several times so, but I continued to write him, it was no problem, <laughs> we exchanged letters. So, socialism finished in November and already in February, Professor Meshulam invited me and in September 1990, I was in Jerusalem, just only for one year, it's 25 years ago, so I am still over there. <laughs> and uh, I thought that I shall work on cannabis research, he told me, no, 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 you know, where, because we're discovered receptors, what do you know? So I would like to know what is the compound in the brain which binds to this receptor. So he invited also specialists on molecular pharmacology, what was Dr. William Devane, the discoverer of cannabinoid receptors. So we were a team just which was supposed to find this compound. So I, my background was analytical chemist and molecular pharmacolog. So it was good combination. I isolated and he just check all my fractions. If these are active, if they bind to cannabinoid receptor. It was a little bit tedious work because uh, we start with uh, red brains which are small and we found that it's uh, very expensive research. So we tried because you know that uh, pig is very, very similar in many directions with humans. So we used pig brain, which is 10 times uh, larger than uh, red brain. And it was no problem to buy it uh, in one store in Jerusalem. It was the cheapest what this butcher sold. But every time when we came to buy new portion of brains, so it was more expensive, and then I think that it was the most expensive <laughs> what he sold in his store. And so at the end, uh, we succeeded. This is uh, on the right side is Dr. William Devane, discoverer of cannabinoid receptors. What was very important, because discovery of cannabinoid receptors and then and the endocannabinoids, it gave us possibility to understand why it works in the body, why it 
influence so many diseases because cannabinoid receptors, these are ones of the most spread receptors in the human body. And that is why it looks like almost like panaceum. It's not panaceum which heals everything, but it's almost like panaceum. So the compound which we found, we named it Anandamand. Ananda from Sanskrit means bliss delight. This was expected effect of this compound, and at the same time, it was also happiness of discoverers because we were happy. Because after one year, I came for one year, after one year we had uh, nothing. We only knew that there is an active compound. And Professor Meshulam wanted to close this research so that we have no chance. But we forced him to try with us another one year and after one and a half year we had results. What surprised me when later uh, they checked uh, levels of uh, alandamide in the brain and levels in, uh, of alandamide in the brain are just picomoles. It means there are hundreds of picograms of this compound. For your imagination, one gram has thousand milligrams and one milligram have thousand micrograms, and one microgram has thousand nanograms, and one nanogram has uh, thousands uh, picograms, and uh, just hundreds of picograms, this was the amount. So when I isolated this compound, and I evaporated it in the tube, so glass was clean, I didn't see anything. But when I check it, for activity, Dr. Devane took it for his bioassay, so he saw that it binds wonderfully to cannabinoid receptors. So it was like uh, to find needle in the hay. Simply you must be also lucky. I can tell you secret why we were lucky. Because all other groups, they work uh, in cold room. Because they thought it, it must be cold room. And we work at laboratory conditions. And it is known today that after this, an level of anandamide goes up in the brain. In that brain. It, not, it doesn't go dramatically up, but it goes a little bit up. Maybe it also helps us uh, to have more material that we succeeded to identify this compound. So this, uh, we found it in uh, March 92, and in December we published it in uh, Science. So um, from that start uh, was explosion, simply, of uh, science, of cannabis, because they started from all points of view. I don't know, today this publication is cited something between three and thousand times, and. Uh, if you put uh, to some database uh, anandamide, so you can see it maybe 10,000 times. So we were very happy that uh, we did some small contribution to, to the legalization of medicinal cannabis. What was surprising simply that compound from higher plant, it means from uh, cannabis buds, tetrahydrocannabinol and compound from the human brain. Both this compound binds to cannabinoid receptors, but about without the same activity, around uh, 40 nanomoles. So in the effect, uh, this THC mimics uh, effect of anandamide in the human brain. So this is everything known today that it's endogenous cannabinoid neurotransmitter and that it's molecular messenger, uh, many publications, so this knows anybody. And then these green compounds, then we isolated and identified uh, the next uh, endocannabinoids. And these two in green, in blue, these were identified in the United States.
In the fact, I can tell you when I isolated uh, 7, 10, 13, 16 docosafetrile oil ethanolamide, I found that it's more active in binding for cannabinoid receptors, but, but because anandamide was first, so everybody concentrate uh, uh, themselves on, uh, on the study of anandamide. Then second was arachidonoil glycerol, is isolated uh, Shimon Ben Shabbat when he did his PhD. And uh, I, at that time, uh, Dr. Devane was not with us, so he teach me via essay and isolation of cannabinoid receptors. So I was able to isolate it from the red brain, and, and I did all via essays of these compounds. How it works in the body? You have cannabinoid receptors, and you have uh, ligands, neurotransmitters, or so endocannabinoids. So you can imagine yourself like uh, that THC means tetrahydrocannabinol from cannabis or CBN cannabinol from cannabis. They bind to cannabinoid receptors. You can imagine it like a lock and when key enter the lock and switch. So start everything what we know from uh, activity of uh, THC. So also things cannabinoid receptors but uh, explain all effects of THC in the body. Of course, there are many other keys which we don't know yet, so it will be process of another study. One of these keys is cannabidiol. In the fact, cannabidiol doesn't bind to cannabinoid receptors. So, in the fact, exact action of cannabidiol, how it works in the body, we don't know yet. So, it's unknown, it's uh, like golden key because uh, cannabidiol is not psychoactive, so it's a 100% legal compound and it treats many diseases, it's very important, it's uh, anti-psychotic drug, so it's very important that when you use THC for treatment that there is also some cannabidiol. And uh, Professor Vincenzo Di Marzo from Italy, when they ask him what uh, is doing uh, endocannabinoids doing endocannabinoids in the body, so he answered uh, just in five words: relax, eat, sleep, forget, and protect. So in these five words is uh, in effect everything. Uh, what can do and the cannabinoids. You know, uh, decriminalization of non-medicinal cannabis uh, started also not only medical cannabis. I was last year, it's about, uh, I think it was in May, I was in Jamaica. And in Jamaica, there are Rasta, and there are Zion Coptic Church. This is uh, ancient Ethiopian Christianity. And both these religions, if we can call them religions, uh, use uh, cannabis as sacrament. But when I was over there, it was 100% illegal. Even if it's sacrament for them, and they don't abuse it, they just use it as sacrament, it was prohibited. But any time, uh, even like that, they cultivated it in the mountains. I was honored really that they took me to the mountains to see how they grow it. They told me that I am first foreigner. That they believe that uh, they can show me this. So I have many pictures also, also with them, but uh, this is just... Uh, this is another, you know, this is stony, stony hilly place where they cultivate it. So we spent the whole day, we left in the morning. It was more than half I went to come to the mountains and returned at midnight. And I think that uh, seminary which we did over there, that also it helped very much because this year in February already Cannabis was decriminalized, and 
arrest her and uh, Tadehodu, this Ethiopian church, they didn't want legalization. They are against legalization. They wanted decriminalization. And their plan was that will be allowed to cultivate only Jamaican cannabis, no import of other, other strains, and that everybody must uh, just ask for cultivation and can cultivate without any problem. So this was a good idea. So Jamaican parliament fulfilled this demand. So from this year, they can use it as sacrament without any problem. You know, they are, I need to explain to you what is legalization and uh, what is the criminalization because uh, this is uh, legalization, what is not legal, so legalization that it's 100% legal, you cannot be punished. And the criminalization, of course, uh, there are still will be maybe some penalties for the use, but uh, you needn't be afraid to go to the jail. I think that even for cannabis, uh, how it looks, for instance, in the United States, uh, it's not good that somebody has stick for a whole life. That is not common because he use it for curiosity. You know, in cannabis, uh, 134 cannabinoids, but don't think that these are the medicinal compounds. Yes, these are medicinal compounds, but if you check different strains, and there will be exactly the same amount of cannabinoids and there are ratio, so different strains can treat different diseases. Yes. What is not a surprise, it's known today. So it means that in cannabis uh, and other compounds which uh, work with cannabinoids uh, and which help to treat person, so, I think that uh, this noise start uh, uh, Dr. Rousseau, Eitan Rousseau, he for, uh, was first who wrote about uh, terpenes, because terpenes are also very useful compounds. I started also identify many terpenes, and this is, uh, I didn't put names because it should be too much. But, uh, Usually, cannabis which is used in medicine, these are cross strains. These are not pure sativa, these are not pure indica. So, composition looks like that. About up to 15 minutes, these are monoterpenoids. And from 15 to 25 minutes, these are sesquiterpenoids. So, what are structurally different compounds? But if we see pure strains, so, there are two types. One is strain, where the main are monoterpenes, usually it's myrcen. Sometimes it's also alpha pinene, but usually it's myrcen. And uh, myrcen, as you see, it's a very important compound, and it's considered that it will result in couch lock. Yes. So, it's not clear, but it's considered because I read also something opposite, but usually it's like that. And there are strains which are high in beta cariophyllene what is sesquiterpen. So these are two main different strains concerning terpenes. Yes, and if these are cross strains, uh, then it's mixture of uh, monoterpenes and sesquiterpenes. And uh, this is uh, really very important for treatment because cariophyllene, this is uh, the only known terpene which binds to cannabinoid receptors. So it's a uh, very important terpene. And more, this binds to peripheral cannabinoid receptor. We don't use today the word peripheral, we use CB2. So from this point of view, it's very important. So in the fact, again, uh, our imagination can lock. Beta-cariophyllene, 
knows to enter the lock what is CB2 receptors and start again everything what is not just uh, this uh, here also appear publication here are some old you see beta caryophyllin mutagenicity very important or protective assay uh, protective assay uh, effect effect is several ischemic injury so also terpenes are very important and I am sure that there are some another term another compounds uh, which uh, will be important from a medicinal point of view. Of course, we, when we are talking about uh, treatment with cannabis, I would like to tell you, I every time say on my lectures, my four no. Cannabis doesn't treat. Every time doesn't treat. Everybody doesn't treat. Every disease doesn't treat every stage of disease. You know, this is something extreme because it's not common. But I must stress it because it can happen. Our patients, that this is exactly for such patients. This is minimum patients, but uh, we must know pluses. Uh, we must know also what is minus. So we don't want to be unfair to tell that everybody will be treated. Mostly patients will be successful in this treatment. But there will be some patients, they don't have uh, these correct genes, unfortunately, that kind of will, uh, will not help them. But this is minimum, yes? So, concerning danger of cannabis, so I want to stress also children. It is used very much in Israel, for instance, uh, children with cancer. Uh, it was used on hundreds of children without any problem. No one children had problem. But uh, there is potential danger for some persons, you know, because children, there is developing brain. So there is certain risk. Uh, with cannabis, that cannabis can uh, trigger psychosis, schizophrenia, and so on. But uh, this possibility is very low, but it's higher at children. And there are some impairments that you cannot uh, see with adults. So adult brain cannot be damaged by cannabinoids, by uh, cannabis plant, but children's brain, there is this possibility. So every time when it should be prescribed for a child, so physicians and parents must uh, think about that if uh, what uh, will help them that it will be better than what can harm them. So in the fact it's uh, very useful, then physician cannot help to children, yes? And it's no other chance, so you can use it without any problem, even with this risk, because you help or you don't help, so it's better to have hope than to leave children to die. So here are five reasons on impact marijuana on children and adolescents. I, so brain continues to undergo important development. It's set up to age 21, but if you consider it up to age 25, you are on the safe side. After age 25, if you are mentally healthy, there is no danger for you. There can be overdosing, but it cannot harm you. Then uh, children, of course, are more sensitive. You know, uh, this we know from past this alcohol. Child abuse alcohol in three months can be heavy alcoholist, and it's impossible to treat it. So also with uh, other drugs, 
not only illegal drugs or cannabis, also some legal drugs means medicine. Children can be dependent on that or it can harm them. So there can be some structural changes in the brain also of children. And uh, what is uh, important that uh, children, if you see their brain, I, I don't know if it will work now. I don't know how to activate it. Okay, that is why, because I want to show you a short movie, how develops uh, in brain gray, brain gray, yes, so matter. But I have it on the other slide. You see that from age five, uh, they studied at the National Institute of Health. So maturing of uh, brain, of uh, brain gray, you see that age 20, is brain gray also already is developed at age five not. And when it's not developed yet, so cannabis can harm. Thankfully, most adolescents who abuse marijuana or use it as medicine do not become psychotic adults, so mostly almost 100% will be okay. But this is theoretically, all, not theoretical, almost theoretical possibility, so you cannot forget this possibility. You know, now it's also important how you give this medicine to the patient. In Israel, there are eight companies which uh, cultivate cannabis. You know, when I compare that uh, Israel is half of Czech Republic, and in Czech Republic they want, uh, now when it's legal, must be more patients. 30 kilograms of uh, cannabis medicine for one year. In Israel, uh, eight growers and each one uh, produce between one and two tons of cannabis buds per year. So you can imagine uh, how much needs patients, what is important. So they give to patients uh, such sex. Uh, and in, the back, in this plastic bag uh, there is uh, written Tikunolam, this is the name of the company. And strain, this strain is Alaska. There is written what is over there, CBD, THC. So they have buds. Uh, it's, of course, not ideal. I can show you later why. Uh, then, patients can have cannabis uh, in oil, in uh, vegetable oil. It's uh, forte, like stronger and uh, regular. Yes, two possibilities. And then again, they have forte and regular cannabis cakes. You see, this is prepared. These cakes are very small. This is for children. Today it's prohibited for adults, even when it worked very good in Israel. But I don't know why they prohibited it to adults. And there are many adult patients which don't smoke. So for them it was... Uh, Excellent choice, and as you can see, you can easily take only quarter of that, so, so it's without any problem. Then, it's not allowed in Israel, capsules uh, with uh, cannabis uh, trichomes, which can be CBD rich or THC rich, or directly extracts. If you like, somebody call it uh, Phoenix tea, so, Rick Simpson oil, but I call it extract, yes, because this is extract, uh, that you extract a uh, plant in organic solvent and when you evaporate a solvent, what is the rest, this is extract. So they put this extract and the uh, patient can swallow it. And there is also, you can use topically cream also uh, in two, different concentrations. 
What is not prohibited in Israel? Uh, what is prohibited in Israel? These are supposed cannabis suppository, but uh, it's used only illegally, and wherever it is used. And no, what I know, Dr. Alan Frankel in the United States, uh, he used for his patients uh, officially suppositories. But usually in the uh, United States or in Israel, they don't consider, consider a suppository like something ethical. I, I don't see uh, any problem because it's treatment and it's uh, suppository, it's uh, really wonderful because uh, it's option for, can, uh, for patients which are not smoking, which are not vaporizing, and it's a good choice for patients which cannot swallow, or patients uh, they have nausea and vomiting, so they cannot keep it in the stomach. So it's a good choice, and it's clear that if you use rectally uh, suppositories, for the same effect, you can use just a half amount. So even this patient, it can be cheaper treat, half, uh, half price for a patient to treat uh, him or herself. So it's, uh, and then also rectally, it's uh, lower first pass metabolism because it mostly goes directly to the blood. It doesn't go like if you swallow it, it goes through liver. So you can lose a lot uh, with first pass metabolism. So at many diseases, this is good choice. So cannabis, you see, suppository, rectal. Also, it's very easy. Usually, they use uh, cacao butter. Cacao butter melts at 26 degrees. So it's very easy. Mix it. You need to heat it too much. So if you have cannabis extract, you know all concentrations. So you know how much you should need to put to this mass and you put it to this fourth and then you keep it in the refrigerator. So you take it from the refrigerator and also it's very easy to enter it to the tomb and uh, it melts instantly. And uh, there are some trends to use just pure cannabinoids, synthesize them and give to patients dronabinol, uh, marinol, I don't know what are the names. So nature knows what it's doing. If you have synthetic cannabinoids, there are still some traces of compounds, but from synthesis. If you isolate, uh, for instance, THC or CBD, there are also traces of some impurities. It's never 100%, but these are natural traces. This can do only good in comparison with synthetic compounds. So, so nature knows. Concerning why I don't like bats for smoking, you know, are many patients in Israel, they, they have just uh, certain amounts from 10, 20 to 100, sometimes 150 grams. So they can prepare extract from them because they have uh, just plant material, these buds, and it's on them how they use it. If I check different buds, so you can see this was free Leonard strain from one grower. So there was between 8.8 and 13 percent THC, yes, in the buds. If I check uh, leaves, which are close, these are small leaves, close to the flowers, so it was about half concentration, and if I use large leaves, it was about one-tenth concentration. But you can see that not each bud and not each leaf has the same concentration. So it also happened that called patient and said, I use all the time the same strain and I had high. And patient doesn't want to be on high, the brain is on high. Patient wants that it just only treats. And this is also a good solution with suppository because in the fact uh, with suppository 
you don't have brain high, yeah, this treats you, so it's also very good. So it's very hard, what I was talking about, sativa and indica strength, it's very hard uh, to find just pure strength. There are some, but usually these are mixtures of sativa and indica. And then, what is it sativa? You know, hemp, I know only one hemp, cannabis sativa. It has different amounts and different cannabinoids in different ratios. So they call it uh, industrial hemp. There is no industrial hemp. It's hemp used in industry, medicinal hemp. No, it's hemp used in medicine, recreational hemp. It's hemp used for recreational use. It depends on the ratio of the compounds and amount. So, and uh, if somebody call it technical hemp or industrial hemp, for some patients, it will be wonderful medicine also. So don't think this is good, this is bad. It depends on you, on your illness, and uh, also on your ability to accept. Because uh, it depends how much you use, because you can use too much, and that you will be overdose, but if you use too much for the other patients, it can be very small dose. We are each different. You know, if comes here somebody with influenza, and we became sick, so one will be sick one day and another week, and another will have problem five weeks. So it depends on parents, so it's very individual, and still doesn't work, uh, genomic treatment, you know, when will be uh, medicine exactly for certain patients. It will be in the future, but uh, it's just only in start, it's in bumpers, yes. So this is what I told you, that are not uh, also the same strains. Because sativa strains are different strains, indica strains are different, and then somebody considers it from a botanical point of view, how look, what is the shape of the leaves. And others don't look if it's uh, botanically sativa or indica strain, but they look how patient is influenced. So if he is influenced that he is uh, refreshed, so uh, they, they call it sativa strain and it's used like for day treatment, and indica, you are calm, so it's used for night treatment. Yes. So we are each other, so everybody must find uh, exact dose and exact strain. You know, this is uh, what I wanted to tell you, that uh, each patient must find his correct strain, because patient can tell you, oh, it doesn't work, I don't want cannabis. It doesn't work, because he didn't use correct strain. Sometimes he must find a certain advantage. It was supposed to be changed uh, now in Israel, but uh, what told me Dr. Resnik happened just two days ago, he will talk about it. Uh, so it will stay as it is. It's with growers. So patient goes to growers. Cannabis in Israel is free of charge. You don't pay for cannabis anything. You pay just to grower for handling. Nobody has. No ministry, nobody has any money from that. Only growers have for handling for his work. So it doesn't depend if patient have 20, grams per month or 150 grams per month pays the, the same amount. This is just for work of grower. And grower, when a patient visit grow, he can tune it. He can change the strain and find the strain which exact fits to these patients. And if it will be changed, how it's in some countries or how they want to do it in Israel, that will be the patient have cannabis 
10% THC, 5% THC, 15% CBD, and so on. So it will be strained with certain level of cannabinoids, might be, but maybe patient needs another strain with the same amount of cannabinoids. Because it works, as I told you, just I told only about terpenes a little bit. So it can be different. You know, concerning also cancer. You know, I know that uh, THC is wonderful, but still we are in the start of our research. We don't know exactly which cannabinoid trees because some cancer is treated by THC, but there are cancers which are treated very good so with CBD. And who knows what are the other compounds. So still we are in the start. What is known, of course, concerning cancer, that you must use decarboxylated cannabinoids. This is very important. If it's not decarboxylated, it doesn't work. And this is certain disadvantage, I think, that patients, they give them buds, and they are not heated, they are not decarboxylated, so patient can use it if he processes it by cold way, so it stays, uh, stay acids over there, and if he use it orally, of course, it will not be effective, because it will not decarboxylate in his stomach. You know, this I said in the start, they, they consider that it's addictive about 10%, but uh, there will be 7%. But what is important, what I mentioned here, they mentioned who is dependent and so on, how it's dangerous, but they don't mention that it's half addiction in comparison if caffeine, yes, or nicotine and alcohol are just more dangerous. This they don't talk about it. And if patient use cannabis where is very low THC and there is CBG, so we cannot talk about dependence because there is no compound to be dependent on. Cannabidiol is very important because it's antipsychotic compound. So it was found already in South Africa and I published in 1974. I had South African uh, strain cannabis and there was no cannabidiol. It was a really surprise. And they found it in South Africa that patients <coughs> but are more psychotic in comparison with patients around the world. And they found that they use uh, strain without cannabidiol. So cannabidiol is uh, very important to regulate it. Yes, and it's also important cannabidiol regulates cancer genes and appeared uh, in the last time, many publications you see like metastasis can be minimized with CBD therapy. Or it's very important in aggressive breast cancer, cannabidiol. Cannabidiol works very good with aggressive breast cancer, so it can be treated with cannabidiol. And here, Alan, I want to remember you, Alan Frankel. You can find him on, uh, on uh, just try Google, Alan Frankel, and he has Alan Frankel journal. You can read every month. He writes uh, very interesting. He is a nice person, and I know him many years, and also visited us in Jerusalem. So he worked with patients. He used uh, suppositories. We appreciate it. It's a very good medicine. So, and treatment with cannabis, of course, if we talk about many diseases, we, talk, we are talking about treatment, but often this is not treatment that uh, patient is fully healthy. This is just mostly palliative treatment. So it's also important to know. And palliative treatment, you must, you must use your medicine. It's not that you stop and you are healthy, you know. It's not flu or running nose. Yes, so sometimes uh, it's necessary to use it chronically. This is just for comparison. I 
put uh, oral use inhalation rectal. You know, orally, if you eat it, you know, who was a uh, very famous cannabis eater, this was uh, writer Charles Baudelaire in the front. They have hashishin clubs and they were uh, hashishin eaters. And if you read poem on hashish of Charles Baudelaire, so Charles Baudelaire wrote that he ate hashish. Uh, it was like diamond in his stomach and he talked with some foreigner. He didn't know this language, but uh, powerful hashish translated him everything. And discussion was reasonable. So it takes 30 to 90 minutes orally. And also bioavailability is about 20%. Inhalation is immediate, very important, especially for multiple sclerosis uh, patients because they need that it works immediately. I gave uh, already, maybe I talked also in Lublin, my friend in Prague, multiple sclerosis, several years on wheelchairs, and also, had, you know, they are. Sometimes they are blind, one eye, then the other eye, then it's uh, again okay. So it costs him 18,000 euro per year, treatment of uh, multiple sclerosis. What treatment? In the fact, he paid 18,000 uh, euro for medicine and it didn't help him. Then father told him, try marijuana. First puff and he get up from wheelchair. Um, it's uh, with uh, multiple sclerosis, it, it looks like a miracle. And he told me, Lumira, just, I saw how he used it, just one puff. He told me, one puff, I work 1.6 kilometers. You know, it's wonderful. And uh, I think last year in, uh, in Beograd was one, one lady with multiple sclerosis. You couldn't believe it. She was also crippled, and uh, when I saw her, she looked like a fully healthy person. You know, so it's a miracle of cannabis. And rectally, as you can see, bioavailability is very high, over 60%. And it's 10 to 15 minutes, and then it lasts for several hours. So it's also important for patients. And what is very important, that uh, if you use it orally, or if you use it uh, by inhalation, so there can be big differences between patients. And when you use it rectally, so effects are predictable even between different patients. What is wonderful. So, I am not propagandist of uh, suppositories, but what I heard and what I know, it's uh, a really excellent medicine. Unfortunately, in some countries where it's allowed, uh, are not allowed suppositories. So, of course, to tolerate Cannabis as medicine, it depends on each person. I told you what is not enough for one is too much for the other, other person. So each must, must find it, you know. So must be each patient very careful, must start this very small amount and must increase it slowly to reach his tolerance then he can feel very good with this medicine. As I told you, cannabis is not, uh, is not harmful of mentally healthy adults. Overdose of cannabis is not harmful, no problem. But overdose can be very uncomfortable. Unfortunately, I met patients you know, they have uh, just amount for whole months. And as some patients, they think, I take more pills, so I take more medicine, it will be faster. So I met patients, they overdose themselves with cannabis, and they said, it's not medicine for me. And never ever they are ready to use it again. 
because of their mistake. So we must be very careful, must be uh, uh, patient must learn and must be teach simply how to use it, that he is using it safely and that will have profit. Now, to buy or not to buy, this is also a big problem because, uh, you know, in Czech Republic, they were for cultivation that patient can cultivate himself cannabis for his use. It's not a good idea. Why? Believe me or not, mostly patients are not able to cultivate cannabis. They are not able to cultivate cannabis. Then if they cultivate it, they are not going to analyze uh, soil, if it's correct soil. If it's not, with, uh, it can be with uh, hard, heavy metals. And you know, cannabis is a special plant if you want clean soil from heavy metals. So plant cannabis, cannabis will clean it. Yes, so they don't know nothing about soil and then patients are not ready to send it for analysis because it's expensive, you know. They are on saving program. So it's better if uh, in society can be like that, that patient can have it officially with very low price or the best free of charge. Because uh, governments in any country, they must understand that when we are young, we need cannabis. When we are such powerful and have a lot of money, we need cannabis. When we are old on pension, and in some countries, from uh, payment to pension, you can drop down significantly, and then you are not rich, and uh, this is a situation in Czech Republic, that if patient wants cannabis, it costs him more than his, his pension. They even, one year before legalization, cannabis in Czech Republic, they had Sativex. Sativex, this small box cost uh, 14,000 Czech crowns. And patients have uh, between 9 and 10 or 9 and 11,000 crowns pension. So there are nobody bought Sativex. So this is very important. We must think about uh, these patients. So some patients, uh, they don't have any choice just to buy on black market. They can buy fake cannabis, false cannabis, and they can buy uh, false uh, extracts. They can buy strain which is not useful for their treatment because maybe there exists a strain which can treat them fully, but they both just different. And then they don't know anything because not every grower, grower illegal grower which grows for patients is fair play. Some of them want uh, just to earn money. They don't care patients if he gives everything. And believe me, patients are ready to give uh, all money for that. I saw this, it's very sad in Czech Republic. When I saw that they pay to some somebody for 60 grams, except quarter million Czech crowns, it's unbelievable. These people should be punished and go to the chair. We sold this to the poor patient. So one lady came to me and she bought on black market cannabis. Uh, 50 gram oil, she, uh, no, uh, 4 gram oil she paid uh, 50 euro. And I analyzed it. It was 23% THC. It's not good, but okay but 15.9% uh, cannabinol. It means that it was extremely heated. Yeah, it's not good. So, other, what do you see? Maui, Maui, mixture of strength, Red Horse, Diesel Barcelona, Hawaii, Black Blackberry. This is what they gave her officially in Israel. And she prepared back at home 
the spoil, if you want, oil, I call it extract. So from my wine, she had 81% THC, wonderful. And from different strains, you see, she had uh, mostly more than 50%. Red horse, she had 40, 44%. Also, strain doesn't tell us anything, because they grow it uh, near Lebanon border, they grow it uh, near Egypt border, so this, uh, di this is different climate even if it's indoor, yes, so, so it's very important uh, to know what you are buying. I, I don't suggest to buy on black market. You must uh, know that this is experienced person, that this is fair play person, that he knows who can treat if you don't have any choice. You know, this is what pays uh, Israeli patient, 370 shekel. 86 euro. It's about 10% of low pension. What is uh, reasonable? Because uh, if they won't like when I compare in Czech, Czech Republic, I told them, oh, if it's 9,000, if they pay uh, 900 crowns a month, they can do that. <coughs> but not uh, more than this pension. This is. Uh, Already not actual. In meantime, it's not actual, but this is I wanted uh, to show you what will be is in Israel in in the near future. But what I heard two days ago, it was not accepted that it will be in a drugstore. So dry cannabis flowers, cannabis in vegetable oil, and cakes. So they had only several sorts with high CBD, with high THC. And high THC, it was for day and for night. So these were the differences. And there were also limits, each, uh, if it's 10% THC, so grower cannot grow all the time 10% THC. And even if he grows on the same place uh, all the time, so if it's on fall or on the spring, it's different. So it's not 10%, but from 6 to 14%, as you can see. Cannabis oil, there was oil, light, and reg uh, forte, and regular, or two, two oils with CBD, like regular and forte. And third were cannabis cookies, again, light, Forte, regular, and two strands with uh, CBD. So it was supposed to be, but it will not be still patient stay with grower, so grower can tune it. You know, what I told you that not each patient will be treated with cannabis. So we must also check the patient if it helps him, because we don't want that it harms the patient. So it's uh, very important. And concerning treatment with cannabis, according to my opinion, it should be that you know everything about patient, how long is he sick, what he used for treatment, and then during treatment with cannabis, all details. Then to know all details about family, what are diseases in the family, and uh, then which disease he treated, which, which strain, and what were the contents compounds. If you will check everything with each patient, maybe in 10 years, you can have conclusions and say, oh, so for this patient, this will be this and this, and this will be probably the disease. It's a full medicine for a patient. Professor Meshulam, uh, he said that what, uh, what he's doing uh, Ananda Mind, so he's doing also THC, so one can be instead of the other one. And it's very interesting, you know, because uh, we have already 23 years Ananda Mind. When it was discovered insulin? In 1921, 
in one year it was very successful medicine. And when was this discovered uh, cortisone in 1935? In the next year it was successful medicine. We discovered Ananda by 23 years ago and it never was used with human. There are volunteers which were ready, but we cannot give it to anybody because uh, such we can be punished for that, you know, such stage conditions. So today it's not such easy. It's not for universities. Universities are not in average. This can do only some pharmaceutical company. So this is still a big one hour. Recent study to physicians. This is uh, Dr. George Kurosh from NIAAA, National Institute of Alcohol Abuse and Alcohol and Alcoholism from National Institute of Health. And Dr. Paul Bacher, also a physician. They are excellent scientists. Uh, I had a possibility to work twice in this lab. So recently they published one paper and there is a very strong statement that probably in the near future almost all diseases will be treated with cannabis. You know, they didn't mention it like that, you know. It supported, uh, of course, this statement with long list of examples in vivo, in vitro, of course, on animals. There are many studies uh, on animals, on humankind, it's, it is not such easy. So that's all. Thank you very much for your attention.